this, but when you talk, say, about domestic violence, and there's a sort of thesis behind it, and I'm putting it in a bit, bit of a nutshell here, so feel free to, to rephrase it, that men are, in the end, if men are pushed too far by a too aggressive a feminism, there will be a backlash, and that there is, you know, there's a sort of undercurrent of, of violence, be it verbal. Oh, that's a warning, not a, not a, that's a warning, not but, but a, it's not a, a commentary on the utility of that. But it's a warning that kind of, of that. suggests that there may be sort of fault in those who push progressivism too far. They will get a backlash. Some people, of course, see that as a bit of a permissive environment for bad behavior. Well, people tend to confuse describing the likelihood of something with supporting the fact that it exists. And I'm describing the likelihood of something, not, not, supporting the fact that it exists, if you push too far on the left, you're going to get a backlash on the right. That's how things work. And this is just a derivation of that as far as I'm concerned. How does that work so, in domestic, in the context of domestic violence? Oh, I don't, I don't think it's applicable in the context of domestic violence at all. I, don't, I think those things are, are completely separate issues. I mean, you, you were mentioning to me just as we were chatting. And I was speaking only politically with regards to the backlash. That was that. That was a comment on on political backlash. It had nothing to do with domestic violence. That's a whole different issue. But violence often pops up in in your work as something you think drives things. That you, I think you've said in relations between men are more are regulated by a background threat of force. And in oh, a sense, that's that's absolutely. why men have difficulty with women. Is that really no? Sad? That's why men have difficulty with women who are completely out of control. But who women should, who have should control women. Well, other women themselves, men, society, just like everyone is controlled. I mean, you're controlled by society. I'm controlled by society. And thank God for that. I mean, it's part of... It's funny. I mean, you, you described yourself as a liberal earlier. And I think a liberal doesn't think that a society controls women or men. Well, let's say regulates. I'm a psychologist as well. But I mean, what does we that control a woman? What is this creature? How do we know when we met one? Well, I'm sure that you've met women in your life that... that acted towards you in a bullying and detestable manner. It's very difficult for women to cope with that because they don't have any real recourse. And female bullying can be unbelievably vicious. And usually that takes the place of, takes the shape of reputation destruction, innuendo and gossip. It's well documented. It's o very difficult women, to defend. But no, men do it too, but men, no. Oh, but sorry, patterns, disproportionately women, in any of you or not. Sorry. Yes, when yes, disproportionately women. That's what the data indicate. I mean, if Where men are. Where is the if, data on innuendo and if, gossip? Well, it's among antisocial behavior among adolescents. It's a well documented field. So, because people look at aggressive and antisocial behavior in women and in men, and in women it tends to take the expression of innuendo, gossip, and reputation destruction, and in men it take, tends to take the form of outright physical aggression. There's a whole literature on that. It's it's not a surprise to anyone. This has been known for for, for 30 years. I mean, the rates of antisocial... I think the idea of the female gossip probably predates 30 years. Well, it does, it does. By a long does. time, but that doesn't... It is, no, but, doesn't make it gospel, but really, people does have, it? No, it doesn't, but people have looked at how women express... Look, women have to express aggression somehow unless you're willing to say that they're not aggressive. They tend not to do it physically. Not to the degree men do, so they use other channels. And what other channels are there other than physical aggression if you're going to be aggressive? Well, you go after people verbally. You go after them with innuendo and gossip and reputation destruction. And that's how it that's how it works. And just to be clear, that you think that's predominantly a female modus operandi? It isn't that I think that. Well, I'm it's that the you. clinical literature indicates that. It isn't that I think it. Well, I'm not interviewing the clinical literature, I'm interviewing you. What do you well, think? Well, I'm a psychologist and a scientist and I tend it. to and I tend to base my opinions on what I've read in the broad relevant clinical literature. I'm not making this stuff up. I studied antisocial behavior for like 15 years. I'm actually quite an expert on it. And so we know that men are more likely to look, look, look at it this way. All right. Women are much more likely to try to commit suicide. And men are much more likely to kill themselves. And the reason for that is that men use lethal force and women don't. Now that's a big difference. Okay, so then you say, well, women manifest aggression towards themselves and to others, but they don't use lethal force. They don't use physical force the same way men do. So they have to do it some other way. Why do well, they have the other to ways? do something some other way? That, you know, because you can people take are aggressive. Hobbesian war against, you know, so you're basically a Hobbesian. Like, uh, no, war I'm half and against half. War. Half and half. Half Hobbes, half Rousseau. That's why I'm not an ideologue. Because I don't think that people are good or evil. I think they're both. I don't think that culture is security or tyranny. I think it's both. And I don't think that nature is benevolence or catastrophe. I think it's both. And that's why I'm not an ideologue. 
And I mean, and wh- where do you stand on the Me Too campaign? Good thing. I think that it risks damaging the presumption of Im- innocence. I mean, there's plenty. Is there of- more to it than that? Oh, sure. Women, women, women face the the arbitrary admixture of sexual uh, advance and workplace and workplace performance all the time. It's a very complicated thing to sort out. We don't know how to sort it out exactly because, you know, I mean, NBC, for example, the American TV station has has made it policy that you're not to hug your co-workers, which, you know, may be true. Although I don't think it's the sort of thing that a corporation might be deciding for people. But we don't know exactly what the rules are for governing male and female behavior in the workplace because we've only been working together for about 35 years. We we don't know. After 35 years, wouldn't it be possible to figure something out? Not when you're talking about a a transformation in behavior that's, that's that profound. I mean, we don't know how men and women can work properly together in the workforce. It's very complicated. But they men do. don't know how to you compete know, millions with of women. men and women across the world go to yeah, work you together have, day but, in, well, day you, out. But you are the one so, who asked about Me you're Too. You're the one me who. Too don't is, start with you're the one who. Me Too is a, well. Me Too is an expression of the fact that men and women are having a hard time regulating their behavior in the workplace. It's the only reason I responded to that because the question I was I think posed. it's more broadly suggesting that, that, that some men are having a grave problem with it. What is the lesson of the Harvey Weinstein story for you? Someone should have said something about Harvey Weinstein much sooner. But we could start somewhere else. We could start with Harvey Weinstein was wrong to do what he did before we get yes, around well, I, to yes, yes. Other, other people should have spoken look, out. It's fair, just, that's look, the secondary no, no, order issue. Fair enough, fair enough. I thought that went without saying. There are going to be psychopathic predators. They're going to exist. And what has to happen is that people have to stop them because they won't stop themselves. And so I thought that was sort of implicit in the statement. Obviously, he shouldn't have done what he did. But you don't think that the culture in which he was operating, that there was particularly in his in world, Hollywood? In, in his world and in many other worlds, that there was a culture of, you know, let this guy's a powerful guy. He's the great silverback gorilla here. Let him get on with it. Oh, I think that culture was everywhere in Hollywood, which is why I think Not it's actually quite well, Hollywood particularly. I mean, the casting couch idea has been around for a very long period of time. And I think that the Hollywood types who are all upset about this should look to their own devices with regards to the role they played in fostering the culture that managed that. So, so know, it sounds like you're the, the well, Hollywood, Hollywood itself, or the women think, or who? who no, is no, the to, entire to culture. Said, we right? talk, We were talking about culture. Yes. So, I mean, it's certainly that the, the, the Hollywood... But what's the, the sensible thing for women to do about Me Too, to your mind, and what's the less sensible thing? That, that's a hard question. It, it isn't obvious to me exactly what men and women have to do in the workplace to make that kind of sexual predation much less likely with also subjecting themselves to restrictions on the sexual aspect of their existence that would be unbearable. It's very difficult. What what would be unbearable about that? How about everybody wears the same uniform to work? That's what the Maoists... Well, look, if you want to eliminate the differences between men and women sexually at the workplace. You have to constrain the sexual differences. I mean, men wear suits to work. Well, we don't have to eliminate the sexual differences for people to work together with respect. You have to eliminate them to some degree. Why? I'm genuinely Because you're trying to, you're trying, the question here is, to what degree should sexually related behavior be impermissible at the workplace? Well, it depends on how you define it. Should you be able to dress attractively? And if you can dress attractively, what do you mean by attractively exactly, like precisely? I got into trouble. I mean, I I hope I'm dressed nicely today. You look very well dressed to me, right? You're a man, I'm a woman. We're both nicely dressed. Now we're getting on with the interview. What's the problem or perspective problem? Well, the problem problem is is, is the boundaries of what constitutes nicely dressed. Because Hmm. there's, look, because part of what constitutes attractiveness, part of what constitutes nicely dressed is sexual attractiveness. Because you can't separate out human attractiveness, sexual attractiveness, from human attractiveness. And so then the question is exactly where are the boundaries? And that's what the discussion is about. Where are the boundaries? The uh, dinner parties, which are described in a foreword to your book, where friends enjoy debates and disagreements. Do you think in the broader conversation we've lost that spirit or in danger of losing that spirit? Oh, I think... I think we're always in danger of losing that spirit, right? Because lack of freedom is much more probable than freedom. 
we have to be very careful to maintain that because it's always under threat. Um, but and I do feel that it's under threat now. I think that people are very careful about what they say in ways that aren't good. I think the fact that many comedians won't perform on university campuses now is a very good indication of that. That's a canary in the coal mine scenario, that. <laughs>